This study in the New Testament book of John is offered for the edification of all students of God's Word by spiritandtruth.org. Pastor Andy Woods of Sugarland Bible Church will be our instructor during this study. It is our prayer that this study will deepen your understanding of the Bible and allow you to draw closer in your relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. John 17.3 Now let's begin our time of study in this important and fascinating book of the Bible. If we could take our Bibles and open them to John 9. Verse 1, we're going to try to look at this morning, verses 1 through 12. The title of our message this morning is, How the Blind Can See. And as you're turning there, I want to thank uh, Dr. Shockley for filling in last week. Um, I think Dr. Shockley has some kind of extra pipeline to God because he knew how to summon the elements to accentuate different parts of his message. And so I'm going to have to get together with him and see how he does that exactly. So let's take a look here at John 9 and verses 1 through 12. Um, If you are with us for the very first time, we are taking a tour through John's Gospel. John's Gospel is about Jesus Christ as the light and the life revealed. John tells us why he wrote the book. He says, Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. We worked our way sometime back through the first major section of John's Gospel, which is a heavenly genealogy linking Christ back to heaven. And we are in the midst of a very long section in John's Gospel. It's taken us quite some time to get through it. But it's a record of Christ's public ministry. And it really revolves around his seven signs and his seven long discourses that he gave. And that's sort of the ground that we've covered uh, in that particular section. And this material that we're entering into in John 9 is highly significant. And the reason it's highly significant is because Christ now is going to perform his sixth major sign. We've studied five signs thus far, the changing the water into wine, the healing of the nobleman's son, the healing of the invalid at the pool of Bethesda, the feeding of the 5,000, the walking on water. And hopefully what's happening is we're going through this book and we're discovering who this man Jesus Christ really is. Not what people think about him or say about him, but who he actually is. And we're moving now into his sixth major sign where he brings a man who has been born blind from birth to a place of not just physical sight. Physical sight is part of it, but by the time we get to the end of the chapter, he will be brought to a place of spiritual sight, which is the great miracle, I believe, that God seeks to replicate in all of us. He wants all of us to see. He wants all of us to have spiritual eyes. And so here's sort of an outline of the chapter. Uh, It has about six parts. We're only going to make it through parts one through three this morning. But you have the the misunderstanding of the disciples, verses one through five. Then you have a healing, verses six and seven. Then then you've got the nosy neighbors. You you all have any nosy neighbors? Uh, The neighbors want to get involved, verses eight through twelve. Next week we'll see the Pharisees investigating the whole thing and then denouncing it. But the chapter kind of crescendos with a very clear revelation of who Jesus is. And we discover a man who had his physical sight restored receives an even greater miracle where he receives his spiritual sight. 
So notice, if you will, verses 1 through 5, starting at verse 1, notice the disciples' misunderstanding. Notice what it says there in John chapter 9 and verse 1. It says, as he uh, passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. Now, most people believe that this miracle is also taking place in the city of Jerusalem, and we think that because Jesus had been in the city of Jerusalem in chapters 7 and chapters and chapter 8. He was in Jerusalem during this time to celebrate one of the Jewish feasts, the Feast of Booths, otherwise known as Tabernacles. Uh, the Hebrew word for it is Sukkot. We've described what that feast is. This is one of the five times Jesus went to Jerusalem as Jews were required to do, to worship God in the temple area, the central sanctuary. Jerusalem, if you ever want to know where it is, just go to the tip of the Dead Sea and hang a left and you will run into it. And we know that this took place in the city of Jerusalem because there's nothing in the text that indicates otherwise. And furthermore, when you drop down to verses 6 and 7, Jesus tells this man who has been born blind to wash himself in the pool of Siloam, which is there in the city of Jerusalem area, as I'll describe a little bit later. So at some point after the events of chapter 8, Jesus is walking along with his disciples, and they run across this man who was not just blind, but he was blind from birth. This is a man that knew nothing. You, you think about this for a minute. He, doesn't, he knows nothing in terms of comprehension but darkness, physically and spiritually, as we'll see. Now, as you go down to verse 2, the disciples ask a question. And the reason I like the question they asked is because it reveals a very common error in the way human beings think about those who are born with disabilities or those who have had bad things, from the human point of view, take place in their lives. Notice, if you will, verse 2. It says, His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he would be born blind. So they're walking along and they run across this man born blind and they ask the question, Jesus, who sinned? This man, is it his own sin or is it his parents' sin that caused this infirmity to happen to him? This is a very common way, an erroneous way, as I'll show you, but a very common way that people think. If you have some sort of disability or some sort of problem in your life that is inexplicable or unexplainable, people have a tendency to attribute it to the vengeance or the justice or the judgment of God for something they have done or something that their parents have done. This idea is as old as the book of Job. The oldest book in the Bible is the book of Job. It doesn't record the oldest events ever. The book of Genesis does that. But in terms of time of writing and setting, the book of Job is the oldest. The book of Genesis was written in about 1446. The book of Job precedes the book of Genesis, going all the way back to the patriarchal time period the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Job was likely written around 2000 B.C. The events of the book of Job take place in 2000 B.C. And you know all well, very well the story of the book of Job. You know all of the difficulties that happened to him, the death of many of his family members, except for his wife, who he probably wished had died, because she said, Curse God and die. Thank you for that marital support. Appreciate that. He was uh, inflicted with leprosy from head to toe. And Job got into the presence of three counselors. Actually, there's a fourth man that shows up later. I put the word counselors in quotation marks because none of these counselors knew what they were talking about. 
But all the counselors, whether it be Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, and later on in the book, a, a guest counselor shows up, a man named Elihu. All of them believe that the reason Job suffered from the affliction that he suffered from is because of some sort of sin in his life. And yet we, as the readers of the book of Job, know that nothing could be further from the truth. Because in Job chapter 1, Job was a godly man. He was so worried not only for his own sin, but for the sins of his children that he offered a sacrifice on their behalf. doesn't really sound like a guy walking in known sin. And in fact, the affliction that he suffered from had nothing to do with sin in his life. It had to do with something that he could not even see or was not privy to. It had to do with a conversation between Satan and God that took place in Job 1 and 2 that Job knew nothing about. Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, Elihu, even Job himself knew nothing about this conversation. And yet all of these human beings, without privy to the angelic manifestation of this conversation, think that they understand why Job is suffering. They go back to that ancient blue uh, playbook, if you will. Sin means suffering. If good things happen in your life, that means you're walking with God. It's a very simplistic formula. Sadly, this doctrine is so common, it has even seeped its way into modern-day Christianity in what is known as the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel is the idea that you are the kid of a king, By the way, that much of it is true. You are the kid of a king. But because you are the kid of a king, you are entitled to a life of health and wealth and prosperity. And if you are not experiencing those things, then obviously you did something wrong. You have some kind of sin in your background that you haven't confessed yet. And so when you listen to or watch so-called Christian television, probably 75 to 80 percent of the people that they have on so-called Christian television teach this doctrine around the clock. In the College of Biblical Studies where I teach, uh, I have many, many students that come into our school from those types of backgrounds. Many of them come in believing in this doctrine called prosperity theology. And I have the unique privilege as God helps me to undo a lot of the confusion and the damage that they are suffering theologically. The disciples here are talking like prosperity theologians when they ask this question of Jesus Christ in verse 2. Now, one of the things we need to understand about heresies is this. In order for a heresy to have traction, there has to be a little bit of truth attached to it. You see, Satan is so good at what he does that he does not give us an outright and overt lie. In fact, what Satan does is he mixes a little bit of truth with a little bit of lie, and that way the lie is all the more non-recognizable and non-discernible. There is truth to the idea that sometimes, not every time, sometimes sin causes sickness. In fact, we saw this in John 5.14, you'll recall, the lame man there at the pool of Bethesda. When Jesus healed this man... Jesus said this, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore, so nothing worse happens to you. This man was in the condition that he was in because of sin in his own life. There is truth to the idea that sometimes we can wander away into sin and we can bring physical calamities Upon ourselves. If somebody is abusing alcohol, their liver will be damaged. If someone is promiscuous sexually, they open themselves up to all sorts of unwanted sexually transmitted diseases and things of that nature. Sometimes we bring physical problems on ourselves through sin. 
The nation of Israel had a covenant with God, which is called a suzerain vassal treaty. They are the only nation in the history of the world that has ever had a covenant with God. And part of this covenant involved blessings and curses. There are blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. Jot down Luke, excuse me, Leviticus 26, and you'll see them very clearly as you read through that chapter. They are restated for the benefit of the conquest generation in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, verses 1 through 14. There are blessings for obedience and there are curses for disobedience. In those chapters, God tells the children of Israel, as they were under this suzerain vassal treaty, that if you obey the Mosaic law, then you will go out and fight your wars and you're going to win. You actually will lend and not borrow. And furthermore, your crops will yield a great abundance. Conversely, if you disobey me, God says, you will go out and fight your wars and you will Lose. You will be the borrower instead of the lender, and your crops will be damaged. They will not yield a harvest. So in Jewish thinking, there is this idea that blessings bring prosperity, uh, excuse me, obedience brings prosperity and blessings, and disobedience brings curses. That was true for Israel nationally as they functioned under this suzerain vassal treaty system. However, having said all that, it is a mistake and it is an error theologically to assume that that principle always works 100% of the time. It works some of the time, but it does not work 100% of the time. How do I know that? Because I have examples in the Bible where God uses suffering in the life of the believer, to accomplish a greater purpose. Sometimes suffering comes upon us not because of anything we have done or left undone. God is simply using suffering to accomplish a greater good. This is what was said to Joseph, or this is what Joseph said to his brothers at the end of the book of Genesis. You recall what happened to Job's brothers, how they mistreated him and threw him into a pit, and yet it was the will of God for that to happen. They left him for dead. Because Joseph was going to be picked up by an Egyptian caravan, and through a circumstances, a series of them, Joseph would be elevated ultimately to second in command in Egypt, whereby he would be the deliverer of the nation in the midst of a famine. You all know that story very well. But you'll notice that God used suffering in the life of Joseph to accomplish his greater purpose. There was no sin in Joseph's life which caused this suffering. In fact, in Genesis 50 and verse 20, Joseph speaks to his brothers at the end of that book, and he says, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. Sometimes God works in our lives in such a way that we do suffer, Not because of our overt rebellion against God, but because God actually has designed suffering in such a way to bring forth a higher result. Now, this is a principle that's not only true in the Old Testament, it is a principle that's true in the New Testament. James 1, verses 2 through 4, says this, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Translation, no suffering, no maturity. The Apostle Paul, I don't think Paul had any great sin in his life, do you? Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored, implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. 
And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The Apostle Paul would not have been the man that he became in God had he not been kept in a place of dependence and consequently usability through a divine infliction of a problem that he begged God to take away. Now, if prosperity gospel is correct, Paul could have spoken the right words and the affliction would have left him instantaneously. And yet we see very clearly from that passage that this is not true. And one of the things we have to accept and wrap our minds around is God's ways are not our ways. The book of Isaiah Chapter 55 and verses 8 and 9 puts it this way. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. You see, there are goals that God has in mind for our lives that take priority and precedence over our immediate comfort. Is God interested in our comfort? I think by and large he is. However, there are times where there is a result that he is seeking to bring forth, as in the case of Paul, as in the case of Joseph, which supersedes how comfortable I am. And consequently, there could be a problem or a sickness or a disease or an infirmity of some sort in my life that is not brought on by any known sin. And we are now running into a case just like this, where a man was born blind, as we're going to discover, not because of a sin he committed, not because of the sin of his parents, but because God had a higher purpose in mind. Notice, if you will, the first part of verse 3. Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents. We have here a unique case where sin does not result in suffering. Can sin result in suffering? Yes, it can. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8 says, We reap what we sow. You sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. We can bring terrible things into our lives through disobedience. But not every problem a person has, is related to some sort of known sin. God was seeking to bring forth a result that this man knew nothing about, that his friends knew nothing about, that his neighbors knew nothing about, that his family knew nothing about. He was seeking to bring forth a result which could not be achieved absent suffering in the eyes of this man who was born blind. What was Jesus trying to do? He was trying to bring forth glory to the Father. Notice again Jesus' answer in verse 3. It was neither this man who sinned nor his parents, but it was so, watch this, that the works of God might be displayed in his life. You see, there is something that's going to happen through this man born blind called a divine healing. This will be Christ's Sixth sign, through this healing, God himself is going to be glorified. We have to understand something, that God works in human history to glorify himself. We call this in theology the doxological purpose of God. Doxa is the Greek word which means glory. God works in our lives in such a way to glorify himself. Everything God does is to glorify himself, and he has the right to it, does he not? He is both the creator and the redeemer. You can't get get better credentials than this. Had this man not been born blind, the miracle that we're about to see would not have occurred. You can't have a healing unless you have a physical problem. 
And had that not happened, the glory of God would not have gone to God. God's purposes in glorifying himself are so awesome and so overarching and so profound that sometimes they are brought into existence through human suffering that God himself allows. This is what they are not teaching, by the way, on so-called Christian television. They're not quoting passages like Exodus 4 and verse 11, which says this, The Lord said to him, that's Moses, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him moot, or deaf, or seeing, or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now we have a promise that in the next life, in the eternal state, all of our diseases will be gone. But that is not an ironclad promise this side of eternity. Now you might be saying, well you don't believe God heals today. I do believe God heals today. I pray for people in this church, and so do the elders, to be healed all the time, we pray that prayer. But there is no guarantee that everyone is healed. That promise only becomes a reality on the other side of eternity, not on this side of the eternity. God can heal, but it is not an ironclad promise. Sometimes God wants people to have problems. Sometimes God wants people sick. Sometimes God wants pain in a person's life to such an extent that they cry out to the Lord three times for it to be taken away, and God every single time says no. And we say, well, then we've done some kind of sin to bring this problem on ourselves. Wrong theology. The right theology is the doxological purposes of God. He will use sicknesses and problems that he allows to accomplish a higher purpose. Notice how Jesus continues to speak about this matter in verse 4. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one or no man can work. Jesus, and he uses the word we, plural, his disciples, existed to do the Father's will, whatever it may be. Jesus has already explained that to us many times in John's Gospel. For example, you might recall John 8 and verse 29. It says, and he who sent me is with me. He has left, he has not left me alone. For I always, not sometimes, I always do the things which are pleasing to him. That was Christ's focus. Christ's focus was to glorify the Father. And we're about to see the glorification of the Father through a divine miracle here in John 9. This blindness that this man suffered from was something that God was going to use to glorify himself. I find it very instructional that Jesus says here in uh, verse 4, We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day, for the night is coming in which no man can work. Jesus understood that his time on the earth was limited. There was an opportunity here to perform a miracle to glorify the Father. That opportunity would not exist forever. In fact, right around the corner, a few years down the road, in the life of Christ, would be his crucifixion and his glorification. After his crucifixion, he would resurrect from the dead and and go back to the Father's right hand, in which time his opportunity to glorify the Father in this specific way would not be available any longer. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when, now notice Jesus doesn't say himself, when no man can work. We have a tendency to think that the opportunities that the Lord has placed before us will always be there. The Lord perhaps is convicting you to share your faith with your unsaved neighbor. And we put it off and we say, I'll do it next month, next year. And we assume that that opportunity will always be there. Yet Jesus says, night is coming in which no man can work. We need to be good stewards of the opportunities God has given us, not 
committing the sin of presumption. What is the sin of presumption? The sin of presumption is thinking that tomorrow is going to be just like today. This is the problem of the commercial uh, leaders there in the book of James, where James rebukes them and says, instead of saying we're going to do this or do that in the business world, you ought to not commit the sin of presumption. You ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will do this or that. Because there is no guarantee that tomorrow is going to be like today. Next year, we think, is going to be just like this year. But in God, we discover that is not true. The fact of the matter is there are opportunities that you have right now that you may not have tomorrow, and in fact, you may never get them back for all of the ages in eternity. Because there are things that you can do for God now that you can't do once you pass into the next life. One of the things that we can do for God now that we'll never have the ability to do in the age to come is to evangelize the lost. Why is that? Because in heaven there are no lost people to evangelize. So therefore the opportunity that you have to evangelize the lost now is on a uh, time clock. The clock is ticking. Another opportunity that you have right now that you will not have in the next life is saying no to your sin nature. The Bible teaches us that in Christ we have the power to tell our sin nature no. We are to rule over our sin nature rather than the sin nature ruling over us. Every minute of our days we have to say no to that sin nature if we are to grow in Christ. In fact, I believe God will reward those believers that habitually say no to the sin nature, not through human willpower, but under the divine resources that he gives us for victory. I can tell the sin nature no today, but if I were to die and pass into the next life, I will never have the ability again to tell my sin nature no, because in heaven there is no sin nature. Even the ministry that I'm doing right now, where I have the opportunity to teach the word of God and edify God's flock and build up God's people in a proper knowledge of the things of God, this is a very limited opportunity. I will not have this opportunity in the next life. Why is that? Because this issue of sanctification and growth is not an issue in the eternal state. Sanctification and growth in Christ is an issue now. And so I find Christ's words to us very instructive. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. And then Jesus, as you drop down into verse 5, reveals his identity. He says, while I am in the world, notice it's limited, it's transitory, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. This is a title, you'll recall, that Jesus claimed for himself in John chapter 8 and verse 12. This is one of Christ's great I am statements where he reveals exactly who he is. You'll recall in John 8 and verse 12, Jesus saying these words, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Why does Jesus reveal himself once again as the light of the world? Because he is about to give physical sight to a human being, which only he can do. Jesus is so awesome and so powerful that not only does he give physical sight to people according to the will of the Father, but he gives them spiritual sight as well. And this is what this man will pick up by the time we reach the end of the chapter. John, early in his book, has already told us that Jesus is the light of the world. John 1 and verses 4 and 5 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. John 3, verses 19 through 21 says, This is the judgment, that light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, for fear that his deeds be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in 
God. Will a physical healing take place here? Yes, it will. But something greater is going to happen. Not only is a man given a spiritual, a physical sight, a lesser miracle, but Jesus is also in the business of doing that greater miracle, opening our eyes to spiritual truth. People ask me all of the time, why don't we see God performing miracles today? My answer to that is, are you kidding me? The greatest miracle is happening all of the time in our midst as Jesus routinely is giving spiritual sight to people. The first 16 years of my life, spiritually speaking, I was blind as a bat. And yet the day comes where the eyes are opened and you can understand spiritual things for the first time. Why do we need this greater miracle that this man is about to receive of spiritual sight? Because we, without Christ, are blind. The Bible is very clear on this. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 14. It says, But the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them. Not that he has difficulty understanding them. Without the Spirit, he cannot understand them. Why not? Because they're spiritually appraised. He doesn't have the right equipment to understand the things of the Spirit because he doesn't have the Spirit of God inside of him. Well, what then is his condition? His condition is 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, which says, In whose case the God of this world, that would be Satan, has blinded, notice the word blinding there, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is in the image of God. Paul, in other writings, talks about how the gospel is veiled. And yet, The Spirit of God takes the blinder off. And consequently, we can see. Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3 and verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot, what? See the kingdom of God. Even before entering the kingdom of God, verse 5 in John 3, Jesus says you can't even see it. Why can't I see it? Because I am born in this state of blindness. And so the greater miracle is about to happen. Spiritual sight is about to be restored to an individual who knows nothing about God. Jesus, with his constant claims of being the light of the world, tells us that he is uniquely qualified to restore spiritual sight. And if that weren't enough, there's more. Not only will this man receive spiritual sight at the end of the chapter, but he will receive his physical sight as well. Genesis 1-3, speaking of physical light, says, Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. 1 Timothy 6 talks about how God is uh, surrounded in unapproachable light. He is in the business of not just restoring people spiritually, the greater miracle, but he does the lesser miracle here as he gives a man physical sight. And so we move on to verses 6 and 7 where this miracle or this healing actually takes place. This is the lesser miracle. The greater miracle of spiritual sight is coming at the end of the chapter. Notice Christ's healing of this blind man, sign number 6, In verse 6, notice what it says. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of spittle and applied applied the clay to his eyes. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. Now, you look at this and you say, this is a very strange way to heal somebody. Spitting in the ground, making mud out of the dirt, applying that to an individual's eyes, and then telling him for the task to be completed, he needed to wash himself in the pool of Siloam. What I want to get across to you is the divine creativity of God. You'll notice that every miracle that the God-man performs is always different. There is always a different tactic that is used. There is always a different approach. There is no one-size-fits-all method. 
There is no, folks, do A, B, and C, and D will happen. Because God is unique, God is outside of man's box and man's thinking. He does things the way he wants to do him, do them because he is sovereign. For example, in John 6 and verse 11, it says this. This is prior to the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus then took the loaves and having given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. Likewise also of fish as much as they wanted. In this case, he's distributing food. You recall the man who was healed, the paralytic, back in chapter 5 near the pool of Bethesda. There was a different approach to this miracle. It says, but he answered them, he who made me well was the one who said to me, pick up your pallet and walk. This time there's no distribution. It's just get up, and by the way, take this pallet that you've been laying on for 38 years and carry that as well. Matthew 12 and verse 13, this is a man's hand that would not work right. Then he said to him, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and it was restored like normal, like the other. God is a God of variety. There are many different ways that he approaches this this business of healing. And if anybody tells you that there's a three-step approach and you're guaranteed to get step four as a result, that is unscriptural and it is unbiblical. God retains his creativity and his sovereignty in this healing business. And he tells this man... To now wash himself in the pool of Siloam. Here's a map of generally where we think the pool of Siloam is. It's at the very bottom of the map, the southeastern side. A footnote in the study Bible uh, regarding the pool of Siloam says this. This lay at the southern extremity of the uh, Tyro... uh, uh, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right. Tyro... uh, 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 Peon, if I'm pronouncing that right, valley, at the south, southern end of Hezekiah's tunnel. You might recognize up in the northeastern side of the map, that right-hand corner, you'll see the pool of Bethesda. That's where the story of John 5 takes place. Now we have a different pool involved. This may be its location and its picture. Why bother you with these technical details? Because I want you to understand that the Bible is a historical book. It documents historically things that took place, how they took place, why they took place, and the geographical location where they took place. God wants us to walk away from a story like this, understanding this is not a book of fiction. This is not a bunch of fables that someone weaved together one night because they were bored. This is actual history. When you are reading the scripture, you are reading a historical source. It is interesting in verse 6, it translates what the pool of Silo means. It says, which is translated sent. One of the points we made very early on in our study of John is that this book (coughs) was written not just to unbelievers, but to Gentiles. Why would we think such a thing? It was obviously written to unbelievers because John 20, verses 30 and 31 says, These things are written that you might believe. You can't believe unless you're first a, what, unbeliever. It's an unbelieving audience. Furthermore, it's a Gentile audience because these expressions that the Hebrew mind would know very well, have to be translated. You don't have to translate a word like this to the Hebrew thinker or writer or speaker. They would know what it means. But you do have to provide such a translation to a Gentile. This is something that has occurred all the way through this book as these Hebrew expressions have been translated. You might recall John 1 and verse 38. It says, Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? Why translate these expressions over and over again? Because John is writing to an unbelieving Gentile audience. If you want to see people come to Christ, 
One of the things you should get people to read is the Gospel of John because it is a unique book. That's one of the reasons I wanted to spend so much time in it with our church. It is written to the unsaved. It is written to people who know nothing about the law of Moses or the things of God. It is the bare basic book that a human being must read, must understand in order to enter into a relationship with God. It is the book that most clearly reveals the identity of Jesus Christ to the unsaved mind. Many, many people come to Christ reading the book of John, it is no doubt that that happens because that is why the Holy Spirit inspired it. And we have to develop a little bit of sophistication regarding why we use certain books for different occasions. There is not a one size fits all concept with the Bible. Not every book accomplishes the same purpose. Matthew's Gospel speaks of the kingdom and why it's in a state of postponement. It's answering a Jewish Question. John's gospel, on the other hand, is written to an unsaved Gentile trying to get them to come to Christ. You'll notice in the second part of verse 7 that the healing itself takes place. Notice what it says in verse 7. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which, trans- which is translated sent. So he went away. And washed, and it's almost anticlimactic how it says this, and the man or he came back seeing. The sixth sign has just transpired. There is a great deal of diversity in how God brings forth these various miraculous manifestations. But let me tell you this much. There's a commonality to it as well. With every healing, what must take place is obedience. Obedience precedes healing. What if this man had not washed in the pool of Siloam? Then the miracle would not have happened. Why does God require people through obedience to do some odd thing so that they can receive their healing? I believe the answer is to attack and to humiliate pride, which is so dominant in the human spirit. You see, we want God to work our way. We want God to work on our schedule. And God comes along and says, okay, I'll give you the result that you want, but you're going to do things my way, which involves you abandoning conventional human wisdom. It involves you abandoning tradition that you are steeped in. And to give up all of that requires an abasement and humiliation. Everything that God does is set up to attack pride, which is so dominant in the human mind. You might recall Naaman of Syria, 2 Kings 5 9 through 14. So Naaman came with his horse and his chariot and stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored to you and you will be clean. You see, Naaman had a skin condition probably similar to leprosy and Elijah doesn't even show up to show Naaman what to do. Just sends a messenger. And this guy's a ruler in Syria. And Elijah sends a messenger saying, here's, here's how to do it. Here's how to get healed. Notice the reaction of Naaman, verse 11. Naaman was furious and went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not, and he mentions a couple of uh, rivers from his own area there in Syria, are not those rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be cleaned? So he turned away in rage. God, you're not operating the way I want you to operate. I wanted the prophet to come out. I wanted to uh, be extended a formal greeting. I wanted him to do some kind of public ceremony or ritual. And I certainly don't want to wash in the dirty Jewish rivers. I want to go home to where I'm from and wash in those rivers. And so Naaman, as many people do, walk away from God 
in a rage. Verse 13, then his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you have not done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down, dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like flesh of a little child, and he was clean. You see, there was a crisis that was happening in Naaman. Naaman said, I can walk away in a rage and live with this skin condition all my days because I'm arrogant and I'm prideful and I want God to work my way. Or I can abase myself, I can obey, I can become humbled and do things God's way. And fortunately, there's a happy ending to the story where he does things God's way and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. I wonder how many people in human history remain sick because they simply would not humble themselves. And it's not just this issue of physical healing. It is the issue of spiritual healing. The gospel works the exact same way. The gospel itself is designed to offend and attack and to wound the arrogance of man. Because the gospel is designed in such a way that when we receive spiritual healing, Romans 3.27 says, boasting is excluded. I can do nothing to boast or brag about my spiritual healing because it was done in such a way that seems silly to man. What has God called us to do to receive the ultimate healing that we need? The gospel is spiritual cleansing. We need to follow his instructions. And his instruction is to do one thing. It is to believe. It is to trust in what he has done. And many people, like Naaman, upon hearing that simple, basic instruction, walk away in rage. Because they say this Christianity thing is just too easy. It's not complicated enough. It's not appealing to my desire for pride and for bragging. And many people today find themselves in hell because they would not humble themselves and come to God on his terms. May I just say to you that we will come to God on his terms or we will not come. The Bible is just as clear as that. So no obedience, Naaman would have remained a leper. No believing, and we send ourselves into an eternity separated from God. Had this man here in John 9 not done exactly what the Lord told him to do, he would have lived out his days in physical blindness and most likely in spiritual blindness blindness as well. Yes, there's great creativity across the board in how God works, but there's always a common theme. There is always a common denominator. God is in the business of abasing human pride. God is in the business of saying no flesh will glory in my presence. And so when you receive something from God, there is always something that he requires us to do, which involves humiliation and unlearning some of the tradition and the principles that we have become so prideful in. No obedience, no healing, either for Naaman or for this man here in John 9. No believing, no spiritual healing for any single human being. You see, God has set up rules or principles or laws which are as intractable as the laws of nature. The same God that set up the law of gravity, for example, objects fall at 32 feet per second, has set up the unseen law of spiritual health. And the law cannot be violated by any human being. There are no exceptions to the rule. Try out the law of gravity sometime. Throw yourself from a two-story building. See if there's an exception. There are no exceptions because God has designed the law. It is unyielding. It is unbending. In the same way, not only are there physical laws, there are spiritual laws. There are spiritual principles that God himself has set in motion that human beings are unqualified to alter. And one of them is how to receive life. 
we will receive life through God's method or we will not receive it. Now, as we drop down to Roman numeral 3, verses 8 through 12, we see the neighbors get into the business. Verses 8 and 9, and then verses 10 through 12, and with these we will be finished. Notice, if you will, verse 8. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, Is this not the one who used to sit and beg? Others were saying, This is he. Still others were saying, No, But he is like him. But he, that's the healed man, kept on insisting, I am the one. Some people saw what was happening and they said to themselves, this man has been healed. It truly is him. Others were saying, no, this is a replica, a duplicate. It must be somebody else. You see, those are the two reactions to this concept of faith. People make a choice. They will either accept what God has done or they will make up some kind of excuse. And the excuses are, can be quite brilliant, quite frankly. I'm a college professor and at a certain due date the papers come in. And I have heard, I think in the almost five years I've been teaching there, every conceivable excuse that the human mind can engineer to come up with why the paper didn't get turned in the way it was supposed to turn in. I could go on and on talking about these excuses. One person actually told me the dog ate my homework. And I said, you're not going to use that one, are you? That's, that's the one I used to use when I was in school. The dog ate my homework. And so people are looking at this man. It's obviously a healing. Some people are receiving it by faith. Other people are coming up with an excuse. The unbelieving mind, if it wants to deny reality, is so powerful. Paul tells us the unbelieving mind can suppress truth. It can revise history. It can rewrite facts. And that's what some are doing as they are seeing this man who obviously has been healed. And as you go down to verses 10 through 12, we read these words. So they were saying to him, how then were your eyes opened? He answered and said, the man who is called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes and said to me, go wash, go to Siloam and wash. And so I went away, I washed, in other words, I did what he told me to do, and I received my sight. They said to him, where is he? And he said, I don't know. Here this man reaffirms the fact that he truly is the man that was once blind and was once a beggar. Those that received this miracle by faith are on the right side. Those who generated some kind of excuse from from the philosophy of their unbelieving mind are on the wrong side of history. You'll notice here, it's very interesting, that this man who has been... uh, healed from his blindness, refers to Jesus as the man who was called Jesus. See, he doesn't fully grasp exactly who it is that he has just encountered. Now, he will understand that at the end of the chapter. But one of the things I want you to see is the growth of this man in his theology. The growth of this man in his Christology. The growth of this man into accurately pinpointing and understanding who Jesus is. This is something that didn't come to him instantaneously, but his knowledge gradually began to develop even after his healing had happened. If you take a look at verse 17 towards the end of the verse, he refers to Jesus as a prophet. If you go down to verse 21, he says whether he is a sinner I don't know. As you go over to verse 33, his growth continues. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Now he's beginning to see that Jesus Christ is a man that has come from God. And finally, his growth in his doctrine of Christ grows to the point where in verse 38 it says, Lord, I believe. At that point he's saved. Lord, I believed. And the verse 38 goes on and says, He worshipped him. He came to an awareness of the full deity 
of Jesus Christ. I believe that this is the pattern that God has for all of us. You might recall it was the same pattern for the woman at the well back in John 4. She referred to Jesus as Sir. And then a little bit later on, she referred to him as a Jew. And then a little bit later on, she referred to him as a prophet. And it's not until you get to the end of John 4 that you discover she had a comprehension of who he was, the Messiah who has come into the world to save the world. This man that has been healed is on that same trajectory. And there are unbelievers all around us that are on this same path. They don't know what you know. They haven't studied the Bible to the extent that you have. But God is bringing them around slowly, adding more and more details to the point where they come to a proper recognition of Jesus Christ and consequently believe in him and have eternal life. That, of course, is why John's gospel was written. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that by believing you may have life in his name. I share this with you just to alert you to the fact that just because you share your faith with somebody and they do not immediately grasp or comprehend what you are saying, don't think that you have failed. Because the Bible teaches evangelism as a process that gradually unfolds. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6, I planted, but Apollos watered. And God gave the increase or the harvest. Some of us are called to plant. Some of us are called to water seeds which are beginning to germinate. And then sometimes God gives us the unique privilege of being at the opposite far end of the process where we actually lead someone to Christ. God may have simply called you to plant a seed through a conversation, through a note, by leaving a track on a table, at a restaurant, by living an exemplary life in Christ, by starting a conversation. And the person doesn't seem to get it. They don't become saved instantaneously. And we think, oh, Lord, I let you down. And the reality is you're exactly where God wants you to do, planting that seed. Gradually what is happening in that person's mind is they are becoming aware of who Jesus Christ is. And who knows, one of these days that person that you had a conversation with may come to Christ. I've told this story before, so so excuse me if you've heard this. But in college, I don't think I lived what, what I would call the most exemplary spiritual life. I would be sort of a person that had my legs in both worlds, the spiritual world and the unsaved world. And I was involved at that time in a ministry called Campus Crusade for Christ. And apparently what happened is I was with an individual standing next to the dorm there in San Bernardino County in Southern California at the University of Redlands where I went to college, I was in a conversation with this individual, and this individual, as I remember him, was the least likely individual who could ever become a Christian. Have you ever met somebody like that? You say, that guy will never get saved. That's who this guy was. He was an atheist. He was a philosophy major. He was uh, on the left wing of every issue that is imaginable. And his worldview was so different than what you read about in the Bible. And during this conversation, and we weren't even talking about spiritual things, a friend of mine pulls me on the uh, shirt collar and says, it's time for us to go. The Campus Crusade meeting is starting. And so we began to walk away from this conversation to the Campus Crusade meeting. And this uh, particular individual says to me, well, where are you guys going? And we said, we're going to Campus Crusade for Christ. And, of course, he was very derisive about that, made fun of it. And apparently what I said to him, and I don't even recall this conversation. I'll tell you how I learned about it in just a moment. But I simply made a a basic statement. I said, you ought to try Christianity sometime. It's a great experience. And that's all I said. Not exactly the richest treatise on theology you could deliver to an individual. And the, about a decade had passed. Anne and I were married. We were living in an apartment there in California. 
And I received a call from this guy. I had forgotten about him. I had forgotten about the conversation. He calls me on the phone, and we got a little bit reacquainted. The memory starts clicking in who this individual was. And he tells me he's a Christian now. And I was somewhat in shock when I heard that because, as I told you before, this is an individual that would be the least likely individual you could ever imagine that would come to Christ. And, of course, I wanted to know how it happened. He reminds me of this conversation. Where God took a silly thing, a guy said, I wasn't even walking with God the way I should have. And God used that to plant a seed in a guy's life. And he told me that this conversation that we had 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 been bugging him for 10 years. It was just a seed I flipped out there, not even knowing what I was saying. God takes an unqualified guy, not walking with the Lord, plants a seed based on a serendipitous conversation. And the Lord uses that to bring someone to Christ. And that's what I'm talking about, how evangelism is this harvest. And whatever God is calling you to do, whatever conversations you're involved in, just be obedient to God. And you really do not know exactly what God is going to do with the situation. And that's what's going on here with this man, born blind from birth. He has received the lesser miracle, and the greater miracle is on the way. Shall we pray? Lord, deliver us from perfectionism. Deliver us from thinking that we have to have every I dotted and every T crossed. You use us exactly where we are in spite of our lack of qualifications. You use us to accomplish purposes which are far greater than we can imagine. Help us to be a people, Lord, that will walk with you and simply respond to the promptings of your Holy Spirit. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. And God's people said. It's not just uh, a man on the pages of the Bible who receives sight. You can receive it right now. Through something we call the gospel, Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, stepped out of eternity into time to live a life in my place which I could never live, to die a horrific death for the penalty of my sins, which I in a lifetime could never pay off. He's done it all for me and you and the world. His final words on the cross, John 19.11, is to telestai which is a Greek expression, which means paid in full. He rose bodily from the dead, as he said he would, which validated every promise he ever made. Every promise he made is ironclad certain because of his bodily resurrection from the dead. He ascended to the right hand of the Father, where he now sits and orchestrates his ministry as high priest and functions as the head of his church, which began in Acts 2, the body of Christ. And the most critical message that the Lord has given the church is the gospel. And the gospel is simply this, trust in the promises of Jesus Christ. There is but a single condition to fulfill. It's not something that's alterable from one person to the next. It's something that is ironclad. In order for a person to enter into a relationship with the God that made them, they must trust or believe in his promises. Believe is a synonym for rely, depend upon, have confidence in. It's something that takes place in the quietness of an individual's heart and in an individual's thoughts as they trust exclusively in Jesus Christ. They quit trusting in their denomination, their 
good works, their effort to try hard. They trust in Jesus Christ. And once they do that, on the authority of the word of God, they have transferred from death to life. If the Spirit of God is convicting you today, today is the day that you can receive your spiritual sight. As best you know how, without raising a hand, walking an aisle, filling out a card, giving money, joining a church, all this other stuff that gets thrown into the mix by man. But in the quietness of your own heart, simply trust in what Jesus has done for you. And if that's something that you have done and are doing, then on the authority of the Word of God, your eternal destiny is now altered. The Holy Spirit is now inside of you, and He is allowing you to see things that you could not begin to see before. If it's something you want more information or explanation on, I'm available after the service to talk, as are any of my friends here with me up on the stage. But it is the most important decision a human being can make because it determines where they spend eternity. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet someone you don't know on the way out. God bless you. You're dismissed.